I'm gonna sort things out with the gang. So in the meantime, go buy some coffee, old man. Got it? At my house, a man named Williams, who was caught cheating with my wife, Amy, declared himself to be a gangster. Taken to Williams's gang, I ran to buy coffee as ordered by Williams. But the moment I handed him the canned coffee, Williams's face twisted in anger. Thinking you can get into the gang with this cheap coffee, don't you dare underestimate the Smith gang, old man. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Williams threw the canned coffee at me in anger. Then, perhaps Williams' voice had been too loud, as people from the gang came out to see what was happening. As soon as they saw my face, they turned pale and bowed deeply towards me. Tyler's brother, we're so sorry, our idiot has caused huge disrespect to you. At the executive's words, both Williams and Amy were bewildered, not understanding the situation. The executive glared at a dumbfounded Williams and began to explain. My name is Tyler. I'm a 43-year-old regular guy who runs a restaurant. Though my life so far might not exactly be called regular, I was told my father passed away in an accident when I was just born, and I grew up living with my mother. My mother was an optimistic woman, always smiling and saying, everything will be all right. But my life changed during my eighth grade year. During class, the school was notified that my mom had collapsed in the street. I rushed to the hospital, but was told she had a stroke and wouldn't last long. In shock, I was asked by doctors and nurses for any family or relatives contact info, but as far as I knew, there was no one. My parents had eloped after a grand romance, and there were no grandparents or relatives to speak of. I ended up alone in the hospital room, watching over my mother as she passed away. With help from the adults around me, I managed to arrange a funeral by mimicking what I'd seen too overwhelmed to even cry, my consciousness fading. Losing my beloved mother, I wondered how I was supposed to keep living. I had planned to study and go to high school, but now, it seemed I had no choice but to find a job. As I was still unable to grasp the reality of being all alone after my mom passed, I heard someone's voice. Is it true that my sister passed away? Turning around, there stood a large, intimidating man, Wondering who he could be, the man suddenly smiled and ruffled my hair. The strength in his large, warm palm shook me, not just physically but emotionally as well. My name is Ryan, your mom was my sister. If you've got nowhere to go, how about coming to stay with me? I had never heard about my mom having a brother, so I was utterly bewildered. But my uncle, after praying to my mom's portrait, murmured, I guess I never did manage to make it up to you, my sister. The last thing I remember before finally succumbing to my exhaustion and falling asleep was thinking how much my uncle resembled my mom. From then on, my uncle took me in and looked after me. His house, to my surprise, was a lavish traditional style building, decorated with flamboyant sliding doors and ornaments in the spacious rooms. I'm not exactly a good person. That's why your mom left home and cut ties with us. You can stay here for a while, but it's up to you to decide what you want to do. I couldn't accept his words at all. How could someone who went to such lengths for me, a nephew he'd just met yesterday, be anything but a good person? Seeing my expression, my uncle continued. Look, I'm involved in organized crime. To the rest of the world, I'm the kind of person they'd rather not deal with. If you're uncomfortable, you're free to leave. I'll give you some money for living expenses. His words were blunt, but he looked me straight in the eyes as he spoke about himself. Seeing my uncle like this, I wanted to trust him. I want to stay with you, uncle. Is that so? I couldn't do right by your mom, but I'll take care of you until you're all grown up. I later found out that my uncle and my grandfather, my mother's father, apparently used to be the head of this organization. As a child, amidst a tumultuous household, my mother always protected her younger brother, practically raising him like a second mother. But as she grew up, 
troubled by her role as the daughter of the organization's head. She eloped with my father, who was entirely unconnected to that world. My grandfather was furious when my mom ran away, so he disowned her. However, my uncle, who had been close to his sister, secretly had people look for my mother's whereabouts. He had known about me and my mother's location for several years. But by that time, he had already become the head of the organization himself. Not wanting to reveal himself as the head of the organization his sister had fled from, my uncle quietly watched over us from afar. However, upon learning of my mother's sudden death, he reached out to me. He regretted not being able to speak to my mother in her final moments and compensated for that by treating me well. In return, I did my best to look after my uncle's son, Tom, who was 10 years younger than me and essentially my cousin, deciding to live in the world of organized crime. Tom grew very attached to me, treating me like his real brother. But one day, after living with my uncle for 10 years, a conflict between rival groups occurred, and gangsters from the opposing group chased after my uncle and me while we were out. Trying to protect my uncle, I was forced to retreat until we were cornered at the edge of a cliff about 10 feet high. In a split second, to protect my uncle from the advancing men, I grabbed him and jumped off the cliff. Upon landing, I felt a terrible pain in my leg. But from above the cliff, I could only see the surprised and fearful faces of our pursuers, showing no signs of following. In doing so, I saved my ankle from danger, but I ended up with critical injuries to both of my legs. Since my ankle is involved in organized crime, we couldn't just go to a regular hospital. I'm sorry, it's my fault. It's not your fault, uncle, I'm just glad you're safe. Eventually, I was left with lasting injuries, and my legs no longer functioned properly. I can walk slowly without issue, but standing for long periods of time, or moving long distances is difficult. Afterwards, my uncle entrusted me with a restaurant that was under the organization's umbrella, saying, Turns out, my sister's decision wasn't wrong, Tyler, from now on, live quietly away from us. Thus, I threw myself into managing the restaurant, eventually expanding to several locations. Before I knew it, about 20 years had passed, and I was living a completely settled life. That's when trouble found me, all because my wife brought a Yakuza into our home. My wife, Amy, is eight years younger than me and was a regular at the restaurant I run, coming in every day for lunch. Given my leg condition, the restaurant had been remodeled for accessibility, removing steps and barriers at the entrance and inside. Amy first visited when she had injured her leg and was so moved by the thoughtful design that she became a big fan of our place. Even after her leg had fully healed, she continued to come in every day for her meals. Naturally, I started talking to Amy, and I was gradually drawn to her bright and kind personality. Realizing Amy felt the same about me, we dated for two years before getting married. I did inform my uncle, who simply said, if you're happy, then that's all that matters. I wonder if, in my uncle's mind, it's as if I, who left home, no longer exist. Honestly, it makes me feel lonely. But I've also come to realize that I can't depend on my uncle forever. I have to live on my own. I haven't told Amy anything about my background or past. So, I guess I'm going to lead a life that has nothing to do with the gang. Thinking this, I spend my days peacefully and leisurely. Then one day, an unexpected person visited my restaurant. You look well. Tom, long time no see. My cousin Tom, my uncle's son, has grown up so much in these 20 years and is now the gang's underboss. It's been about 20 years since we last met, hasn't it? Today, there's something I wanted to discuss with you, Tyler. With such an introduction, Tom shared something with me. Can it really be something like that? What happens next is up to you, Tyler. I'll be heading back now. The news I had just heard was so shocking, I couldn't move. But somehow, I managed to get my stiff legs moving to see Tom off. Then, Tom suddenly showed a vulnerable expression, like that of a small child. 
Even if you think you're prepared for a time like this, it's still unnerving. If anything happens, contact me right away, for me, Tom, your precious family. When I potted him on the shoulder to cheer him up, Tom brightened up, laughed cheerfully, and left the restaurant with big strides. Though I was troubled by what Tom had told me, I was facing an even more serious situation on my end. Amy's attitude towards me had gradually become colder. When we got married, she used to cook delicious meals every day, waiting for me to come home. Being welcomed by her smile made me truly glad I got married. But as half a year and then a year passed by, Amy started neglecting household chores. Our conversations became perfunctory, and at times, she would ignore me even when I spoke to her. She left meals and laundry undone, withdrawing money from my account without permission, dressing up flamboyantly like she was still single, and going out at all hours without any regard for day or night. I didn't know when she would come back, so I tried emailing her out of concern, only to find that she had changed her address, and I couldn't reach her. When I tried calling her, it didn't even ring, meaning she had blocked my number, so we were completely out of touch. She comes home late at night, so our schedules are completely out of sync since I have work in the morning. After living like strangers in our own home for about three months, staying in our empty, messy house became too much for me, and I started coming home as late as possible. But that day, by chance, we had fewer customers, and I sent the part-time workers home early. Deciding it wouldn't make sense to keep the restaurant open any longer, so I went home early too. When I opened the front door and saw Amy's high heels, I thought it was unusual for her to be home. But at the same time, seeing unfamiliar men's shoes next to hers made my heart start pounding. I broke into a cold sweat. My body felt fiery hot, yet my senses were sharply alert. I immediately suspected she was cheating, but thought maybe it's just a friend visiting, so I didn't go to the living room and instead headed upstairs to my room. However, as I quietly entered the house, I could hear Amy and her company talking loudly. I thought I had hit the jackpot marrying a rich guy, but he turned out to be a total dud. But he's a boss, right? Owning several restaurants should be good enough. The person Amy was talking to was a man, and someone I didn't know. But it's just a few small-time restaurants around here, so it's totally worthless, and him limping when he walks is just creepy. You're so much younger and cuter than him, Amy. It's a waste to be with someone like that. Why don't you leave him? Amy laughed heartily in response to the man's words. But I hate the idea of working for a living now. I want to make him work while I hang out with you, Williams, and live freely. When Amy laughed loudly, the man called Williams also joined in with a loud, graceless laugh. But you married him, so you must have liked him at some point, right? Stop joking, I never liked that shabby man from the start. I thought he had money because he owned popular restaurants, so I was a bit nice to him, and then he proposed out of nowhere. Hearing Amy's words, I felt a deep, cold weight in my chest. I had never dreamed that Amy thought this way, despite all the time we'd spent together. What a terrible woman, spending someone's money while cheating on them with me. I'm getting bored, so I'm planning to ignore him thoroughly until he brings up breaking up. I'm thinking of squeezing as much money out of him as possible for alimony. This was roughly the exchange between Amy and Williams. In other words, Amy had been planning this from the start, marrying me for my wealth. Shocked beyond words, I stood frozen at the entrance, listening to their cheerful conversation. But I couldn't just stand there listening forever. Before I knew it, quite some time had passed since I entered the house. Feeling the need to confront the situation, I boldly went inside and flung open the door to the living room. Hey, I need an explanation for this. What I saw was exactly what I had expected. Amy was in the midst of it with Williams. Startled by my sudden appearance, Amy just stared blankly, repeatedly muttering, Ha, ha, why is Tyler here? When did you get back? While Amy was visibly shaken and turned pale, 
Williams, on the other hand, looked at me with a defiant smirk. Hey, hey, you're supposed to knock before entering, hubby. Still smirking, Williams casually moved away from Amy, maintaining his composed demeanor. Seeing Williams's composed demeanor, Amy must have been influenced as well. Forgetting her earlier panic, she calmly fixed her hair and said, What do you mean, what's this about? It's exactly as you see. Do you need an explanation, joining in his defiant attitude? That response made my heart feel even heavier. So, you really never loved me from the start? Of course not. Why would someone young and cute like me get close to an old man like you? She burst out laughing loudly. Did you really think I loved you all this time? You must be delusional. I just wanted to marry Rich so I wouldn't have to work. With that, Amy ostentatiously snuggled up to Williams. I was looking for a suitable marriage partner and found you, who seemed easy to deceive. You owned several restaurants and had a physical disability, so I thought I could easily ingratiate myself with you. Amy here has spoken, stop deluding yourself into thinking you're loved, just pay up quietly and disappear. Interrupted by Williams, I couldn't hold back and retorted, why should I be the one to pay? For alimony, obviously, apologize for causing emotional distress to a young and beautiful woman like Amy by marrying her. What he was saying was absurd. Amy leaned against Williams, twirling her hair, as if she was an involved. Unable to stand the sight of her, I muttered in disgust. The one who suffered emotional distress is me. I'll be the one demanding damages from you too. What did you say? Don't you dare speak to me like that. I'm a gangster around here. The Smith group is a big deal. Williams advanced on me, his breathing heavy. But I was taken aback when he mentioned the name. Are you really from the Smith group? Doubting me? Don't mess with me. I'm Williams of the Smith group. Williams faced me head on, clenching his teeth and putting force into his words. The next moment, I found myself pleading with Williams, bowing my head. Please, take me to your group. Huh? You want to join our group? Williams was momentarily stunned and surprised, but then he spat out with an irritated expression. An old man like you wanting to become a gangster now, what a pain. If you really insist, bringing money first is the proper way. I'll pay, so first, can you take me to the Smith group? By then, I had completely forgotten about Amy's presence. Knowing Williams was a member of the Smith group, all I could think about was my desire to meet the boss. As I continued to bow my head earnestly, I heard Amy mutter in disgust, what's with this guy, so uncool, but I couldn't bother with that now. How long had I been bowing my head? Williams sighed with boredom. Fine, follow me right now. With that, Williams drove off with me and Amy in tow. In the car, Amy mocked me several times, saying, you're in your 40s and planning to become a gangster. You can even walk properly, how could you be of any use? But Amy meant nothing to me now. Thinking simply that I'd divorce Amy once everything was settled, I waited patiently to arrive at the group's location. We're here, I'll go talk to the boss, so in the meantime, old man, go buy some coffee, haha. Ha. Understood. I stepped out of the group's large gate, slipped into a back alley, and bought a can of coffee from a vending machine. When I returned to the group, Williams was just coming back to the entrance. The moment I handed him the can of coffee, his face twisted in anger. You think a cheap coffee like this is going to get you into the group? Old man, don't you dare disrespect the Smith group. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. As I apologized, Williams threw the can of coffee at me. Williams's loud voice must have carried to the back because someone from the group came out to see what was happening. Hey Williams, what's all this commotion? This guy, despite being an old man, says he wants to become a gang member now. But he couldn't even buy a proper coffee so I was putting him in his place. Hearing Williams's words, the gang member frowned slightly and looked at me. But you don't need to make such a fuss, huh? I've seen you somewhere before. 
The gang member who was admonishing Williams peered into my face, tilting his head in thought. Who was it again, ah? Uh? Suddenly, the gang member shouted out loud, turned pale, and dashed to the back. Before I knew it, he returned, followed by the boss and several high-ranking members. All were tough-looking men, and not only Amy but also Williams turned pale, wondering what was happening. Bosses, what brings you all here together? You, where did you meet Tyler? With a loud voice, one of the executives grabbed Williams. The other executives turned pale and began bowing towards me. We're truly sorry, Brother Tyler, our fool has made a terrible mistake. No, please, raise your heads. Seeing me speak to the executives as equals, Williams started yelling in a red fury. I was asked by this old man, he begged to join the group, so I just brought him along. This person is a legendary gangster, without Tyler, the Smith group would have been history a long time ago. Williams and Amy were bewildered, not understanding the situation. The executive glared at a stunned Williams and began to explain. Twenty years ago, Tyler risked his life to save the boss. Eh, this old man, Tyler did, what do you mean? Finally changing his attitude towards me, I clarified for Williams. This place is my home. I, too, was once a gangster. When we became gangsters, Tyler had already left this home. It's an honor to see your face again after such a long time. The executive bowed deeply and then suddenly lowered his voice. Did you come to see the boss today? Yeah, Tom had come by earlier and told me about the situation. But my uncle seemed hesitant to let me back in here, saying I was in trouble. I found out from Tom that my uncle was diagnosed with heart disease and apparently had only six months to live without treatment. They recommended surgery, but the success rate is only 40%. Upon learning this fact from Tom, I immediately wanted to see my uncle. But Tom shook his head, saying that my uncle wanted me to have a normal, happy life and urged me never to return to the gang. My father has always regretted making you end up like this. He feels sorry and wants you to live happily, he said. Given these circumstances, if I had approached the gang directly, I probably wouldn't have been allowed in due to my uncle's instructions. That's when I thought to seek help from Williams, who turned out to be a member of the Smith group, by chance. Upon learning everything, Williams trembled and began to prostrate himself. I'm so sorry, I didn't know anything. Please forgive me. His voice, repeating apologies as if rubbing his face on the ground. Must have been loud enough that more people came out from the back. It was Tom, the group's underboss himself. Seeing me, Tom's eyes widened in surprise. Brother Tyler, how did you get in here? By chance, someone willing to help me out. After the executives explained the situation, Tom raised his eyebrow slightly. Ah, so Brother Tyler got cheated on. Well, I guess this is the limit of my manhood. With a wry smile, Tom furrowed his brows for there. That's not true at all. There's no one more handsome than you, Tyler, so, what will you do about that man? Before I could reply, an executive stepped forward. There's no need to trouble the underboss with this. Williams will be expelled, he's smeared mud on the gang's name, and he will take full responsibility for it. Leaving those words behind, the executive took a now subdued Williams away to somewhere. Then Amy chimed in from the side desperately trying to charm me into forgiving her. I'm not involved, right? It was just an affair, right? An affair is wrong regardless of whether you're a gangster or not. Tom, with veins popping on his forehead in anger, made Amy shrink back in surprise. That's when I stepped in front of Amy, holding Tom back. If it was just an affair, maybe I'd have some responsibility too. But you, you've been up to no good since before we got married, haven't you? That's... She must have remembered confessing about marrying for money. Amy, sweating on her forehead, desperately looked around for an escape. But you also hid that you were from a gangster background. Doesn't that make us even? 
True, hiding my past was wrong, but you were trying to deceive me for money, that's far worse than hiding being a gangster, isn't it? Amy couldn't say anything back to me, just looked down and started sobbing quietly. That's when Tom spoke up. You really did something terrible to Tyler, didn't you? Don't think you'll get off easy. He said in a calm tone that somehow made the room go even quieter. Ever since our uncle fell old, Tom has been effectively running the show as the de facto leader. So, when Tom speaks, it's as if the leader himself has spoken, and everyone follows. Take her away. With just those words from Tom, some members took Amy away somewhere. A divorce paper was sent afterwards, but that was the last time I ever saw Amy directly. I'm leaving it to you now. I said, then started walking towards my uncle's room. He was lying in a spacious room, quietly with his eyes closed. Uncle, I called out. Tyler, I told you not to come. You're free now. You can live your life. Forget about me, he replied with a sigh. Unable to just listen to his sighing voice, I crawled on my knees to him and grabbed his hand. The same large, warm hand that had potted my head so firmly the day we first met. Now, it felt thin, cool, and much smaller. Didn't you say you regretted never meeting my mom? About that. Uncle seemed to choke on his words, perhaps remembering something he'd said in the past. I gripped his hand tightly. I would have regretted it too if I hadn't met you. I came because I wanted to see you. I am living freely, I told him. Looks like you've outdone me. He said with a hearty laugh in response to my words. And so, I decided to stay by my uncle's side, from his hospitalization through to his surgery. On the day of the surgery, Tom and I went to cheer him on, and fortunately, the surgery was a success. Now, he's slowly regaining the strength he had lost, spending his days peacefully. Afterwards, Williams was expelled and could no longer use the gang's name. Not that he could go back to being a civilian, he wandered around looking for day-to-day -day work until his funds finally hit zero. He tried to apply for welfare, but was denied due to the strict anti-gang laws. Eventually running out of money, he had to beg for loans from gang affiliates and ended up bankrupt because he couldn't pay the interest. As a result, he's now being forced to do physical labor at gang-related sites. Working to exhaustion every day, he's slowly paying off his debts. As for Amy, she's been made to work in a nightclub. Due to a significant amount of debt from embezzlement for her affairs and as alimony to me. She's working from morning till night without a day off. Perhaps due to the exhaustion, she's aged rapidly, looking like she's in her 50s even though she's still in her 30s. While she could serve customers due to her looks. After she became worn out, she's been pushed around as a cleaner, exploited to the bone. As for me, my uncle finally got discharged the other day, and we celebrated his recovery with the gang. Seeing him after being away for 20 years, I could tell he'd aged significantly and I was overwhelmed with emotion. Thank you for saving me, I'm truly grateful you took me in that day, I said expressing my sincere gratitude. Uncle didn't say anything in response, he just kept nodding deeply over and over again. He's decided to hand over the gang to Tom, and he'll retire. For his retirement, Uncle chose to work at the restaurant I run. He's always been particular about coffee and now he serves delicious coffee to customers as a barista who's too silent. Sometimes, in between gang duties, Tom also visits the shop, comparing my and my uncle's coffee contentedly. I plan to continue repaying my uncle for his past kindness, while living continuing to live a peaceful daily life.